Greetings and salutations, young true believers. So today we are going to talk about Jurgen Habermas on the public sphere. And to understand what Habermas is up to, you gotta, you gotta know a little bit of the background um, in which he's writing, right? So Habermas is arguably the world's most famous living philosopher. He's still alive. He's, he's you know, 90 years young and still going. Um, Heidegger grew up in post World War One Germany, um, he was born in twenty nine, and of course he was you know only ten when World War Two broke out, and he saw you know obviously firsthand the destruction that uh, World War Two brought on Germany, right? And he regarded that as a, just a systematic failure of, of the German political sphere, right? Um, so he's a young philosophy student, and the most uh, most famous philosopher in Germany in the 50s. He's a, you know, he's a young man at the university. He's writing his dissertation. The most famous philosopher in Germany at that time was a guy named Mar uh, Martin Heidegger. And Heidegger, during World War II, had been a member of the Nazi party. He was actually a member of the party. And uh, Heidegger never really apologized after the war for his participation with the Nazis. Uh, the closest he came to ever issuing... Uh, a condemnation of national socialism in Germany was to say uh, his participation was a blunder, right? So, uh, Habermas is concerned by this, and, and he writes a letter. You know, again, he's a young doctoral student in philosophy. He writes a letter to Habermas uh, to, to Heidegger, and he asks Heidegger to um, to explain. His participation with National Socialism. Why were you, um, why were you involved with the Nazis? You're, you're the leading intellectual figure in Germany at this time, right? Um, and Heidegger just brushed him off. He didn't say anything. Just complete dead silence, right? So that confirmed Habermas's view, his conviction that the German philosophical tradition, dating back to the uh, the early 18th century, had had failed, right? Um, it, it didn't provide German intellectuals with the resources they needed to understand and then criticize National Socialism. So this got uh, young Habermas interested in what he calls, again, the public sphere. And in our readings, and this is page, um, this is actually the very first sentence of the article, right? Page 143, Habermas defines the public sphere as, first of all, a domain of our social life in which such a thing as public opinion can be formed. And he notes that access to the public sphere is open in principle to all citizens. A portion of the public sphere is constituted in every conversation in which private persons come together to form a public. So this is significant. Why is this significant? Well, you can see a lot of what, or you can understand, I suppose I should say, a lot of what's going on in uh, Western philosophy uh, for the past 500 years. 10, 520 years as a reaction to what happened in the Middle Ages, right? Uh, much of what's happened in the past 500 plus years has been a, a rejection of everything that, that came about in the Middle Ages. Okay, well, what was so characteristic about the Middle Ages? Authoritarianism. Authoritarianism in politics, authoritarianism in religion, authoritarianism with respect to learning and academia and science, right? Um, what changed all this? Well, Habermas points out in the 18th century in France and Germany, uh, a lot of places on the continent of Europe, but especially France and Germany, um, you had what were known as salons. Now, don't think you know, the modern American understanding of salon. A salon was originally just the living room of a big, you know, a big house, right, uh, where important people in society lived, right? They had, they, you always had a big drawing room where you would have guests. Well, what would happen is these guests would get together and they were always the leading figures in the art world and, and in politics and in science and philosophy. And they'd get together and they would discuss the, they would discuss the issues of the day, right? Um, and then later on, their meetings became referred, they, they came to be known as, as salons. So on Habermas's view, this is the beginning of the public sphere, a sphere that's not subject to the king or the uh, queen and his or her dictates, but a place in which the public can form their own opinions. And this, in turn, led to all of these these gentlemen, uh, scholars, right, starting up um, clubs and newspapers. He goes at length uh, in the article about that. 
this, of course, ultimately, it, it, there's a transformation in the media from reporting the news to uh, weighing in on matters and then later perhaps dictating uh, or conveying opinions about what should or should not be the case in politics. That was significant, right? That's, again, another instance of the public uh, not just reacting to the news, but, you know, making informing policy, right? So what's going on toward the, you know, in more recent times, because the piece that we, uh, that we're reading uh, for today, um, this was published in 1989, right? Well, toward the end, right, of the article, page 146, Habermas tell us, tells us the public sphere, which must now mediate these demands. What are these demands? The demand between uh, the, the rub, right, the conflict, if you will, between what he calls group needs. Um, so what are group needs? We see that a lot in the United States, the needs for social justice, the needs um, for oppressed persons to be able to redress their grievances, right? So group needs, which cannot expect satisfaction from a self-regulating market, right? And then, of course, the private sphere, right? So how to, uh, excuse me, Habermas goes on. The public sphere, which must now mediate these demands, becomes a field for competition among interests and a cruder, uh, cruder form of forcible confrontation. And we've seen that in our country last summer, right? Forcible confrontation. The group needs are not being met. There's going to be confrontation, right? So, as he goes on to note, today it is the social organizations that act in relation to the state and the public uh, political public sphere, whether through the mediation of po uh, political parties or directly in interplay with public administration, right? And this is, uh, he's, he's got a caution for us here, right? A little bit further down, he notes, this leads to a kind of re-feudalization of the public sphere. You recall that feudalism was the economic system that dominated the Middle Ages, where uh, a lord would hire um, several uh, servants, peasants, right? Um, serfs as they were known to to work the land and grow the food and he would provide them with crude shelter and defense in, in case of an attack right so he uh, habermas goes on large-scale organizations strive for political compromises with the state and with one another behind closed doors if possible but at the same time they had to secure at least plebiscitarian that is to say um nodding right not perhaps unanimous or even uh enthusiastic support right uh, or approval from the mass of the population through the deployment of a staged form of publicity in other words politics right um, this is alarming because it, it denotes to or suggests the Habermas a weakening of the public sphere right um, what's happening well we see welfare states popping up which are designed to deal with the crisis um, with of group needs, however, right, um, under current circumstances, right, um, only a a public of what he calls private persons, right, uh, could have could participate effectively in a process of public communication using the channels of interparty and interorganizational public spheres on the basis of a publicness enforced for the dealings of organizations with the state. So in other words, what's, what's, what we're seeing, right, is that the larger masses are uh, too often not getting their groups, their, their group needs, what he calls group needs, met. And the only people with access to the corridors of power are those who already are people of means. And we see this a lot in the United States, right? So this is disconcerting. This is worrisome because this trend has the, the potential to undermine civil society, right? So in Habermas's view, what we need to do is reinvigorate uh, the public sphere.